Hello, my name is Joel Porragi and I work on a type preserving heap profiler for C++. There are some existing tools like uh, type uh, like heap profilers for C++ or type aware heap profilers for other mostly managed languages where uh, using reflection it's easier to implement them but there is no, no or no, not too many current implementations. Uh, there is actually one uh, the, in the new Visual Studio uh, you can uh, see type information but uh, it's only available in it uh, with uh, 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 a special environment where it uh, logs these extra information uh, using a malloc and uh, there are also other tools like dot memory for dot net or g uh, profiler for java which are managed languages and there you can uh, access every type information uh, during the runtime of the program so they can collect this and show it to you heap profilers are essential uh, essential tools in understanding your program uh, it's dynamic behavior for example to you can find bugs with them or make uh, or improve its performance if you can analyze where it uses too, mu too much memory or or where, where can you improve its uh, memory allocations so for example this is a screenshot of dot memory uh, where which is a great tool because it has a nice user interface uh, and since it knows ev everything about the types in the program you can uh, uh, see at any snapshot the allocated types how much memory is used by a, li a list or some any other objects but in C++ we have tools like Walgreens Massive uh, there are of course better uh, visualizations for it than this this is a console version there's a great tool called Massive Visualizer, Visualizer. Uh, this is the same graph as before but it's uh, in a most, uh, more user-friendly display as you can see there are some information about the different regions of your heap but it's not type uh, it's based on the call, call stack of the all location uh, here it shows the most recent call before malloc new or some other allocation function was called and because of this uh, types like vector or set or anything can show up as multiple categories here you can't tell how much memory uh, a certain vector or anything uses because you can't distinguish it as a single, single entity so this is why we need a type aware heap profiler for C++ to see the problem this is a very minimal pro uh, program it just allocates an integer and deletes it but if we uh, check what happens in the background we have operator new and delete uh, which only work on void po pointers not the actual type they allocate memory or release it and uh, have no idea about what are you using that memory for they also call usually malloc or free which are system functions and tools like uh, massive hook on these functions because they are system calls and easy to intercept and uh, that's that's how they uh, analyze your memory usage it also means that uh, internal memory managers which are 
of the using C++ programs make these tools uh, unusable. So you have to disable your internal memory manager if you want to use something like wall grind. But it's a also great uh, and easy uh, option since it requires no modification in your program. You compile it, you run it with wall grind, and you get uh, your heap results. So the problem is if you want to extract the type information, it's theoretically possible. You have the source code, you have deb debug symbols, uh, and if you also disable inlining, and know you how your program was compiled, the exact compiler uh, commands, you can uh, you can deduce the type information from your call stack. It's there somewhere. It's just not easy. It's not practical in general. Uh, that's why tools like uh, Massive won't do it. So we need uh, some other way to uh, to log our types with uh, our heap usage. And uh, to do that, we have to modify our, our programs. The easiest idea is that we can use macros to this. We can define do macros, one called delete, and one called new. After this, everywhere where in your, your program, where, when we call these functions, instead our macros will be called, which are expanded to uh, constructors of marker classes and operators. With this, when you write new something, uh, new will be called, which returns a pointer to a type struct, to something, some type t, and you can uh, use a template operator to access this type information. You can log it or do anything with it in this function, and as long as this operator returns the pointer uh, allocated by new, the program will work as before. The same works with delete. You can intercept that pointer, do something with it, and of course delete it in the end. The only difference is that we are using a different operator here because of operator precedence. So this is great, and as you can see, it can be implemented in a few lines. Yes? Um, so technically, you're not supposed to do this because you, define a, you, you pound to find a keyword, and that's explicitly forbidden. I don't know any reason why it won't work, but the standard says you can't do that. Uh, it's I, don't, I, don't phrase, I don't know a compiler where it won't work on, but the, the uh, says you can't redefine. Yes, that's possible. Uh, we are using it uh, for some years, now, so it worked. But it's true that it, this is the, the best solution. That's why uh, uh, I want to present a better one in this presentation. <laughs> it, it's really ju just a hack, and there are problems with it, even if it works with compilers. So the problem, for example, we have arrays. And if you want to delete an array, we have to add these braces after delete, which won't be, won't be matched by our delete handle uh, macro, resulting in a syntactically problematic uh, code. It won't compile. So if you define macros like this, you have to undefine them before deleting an array, log the delete operation by hand, and redefine them again. For example, you can, this, uh, can do this with a delete array function, but it still requires code modification. And makes, uh, ma it's, it's really problematic when you uh, include external libraries for, into your project. Every time you add new code, you have to modify it, or it even won't compile. Also, the new marker is, it, it compiles still with arrays, but we 
and we can look the size of the type that's great but we have no idea about the the size of the array we are all allocating that here so if I allocate an integer array of 10 elements I don't have any idea about the, this array size here so we have to as uh, override operator new and log the entire allocation size there, there and deduce the array size of, uh, based on these two data and we can't forget that there are operator new and operator delete which this, ca this can be called directly with uh, when they will just return a void pointer but this is often used to allocate uh, an arbitrary number of memory for example in the standard allocators they work by calling operator new and operator delete which again results in a code uh, which is syntactically uh, bad since we can't call operator new marker star new that's bad code again we have to undefine them and call them uh, again which is uh, really problematic since we can't modify uh, the code in the standard library that means we have to compile our code with a customized version of uh, allocators and other structures and if we are speaking about allocators this is a simple code it's a vector with size with uh, just some size even if we, if we modify the uh, source code the source code of the allocators we only see that we allocated an array of integers we don't know if it's an it's if it's a vector if it's just a plain array or any other struct with allocated integers so we we still lost time in uh, type information the type of the standard container used that's because that allocator is there and that allocates the memory of course we can use our old allocators and create a, a custom vector allocators custom map allocators and if we use these everywhere in the code we can retain the information that we used vectors okay and also there is placement new this is great because it won't won't cause any compilation errors so we are logging that we called placement new but uh, placement new actually won't allocate any new memory it just initializes the object at that address we gave it so this is also a use case which we have to handle specifically and otherwise it will result in errors in our logs we will see more allocations that there is really okay so these are the problems with the macro base the solution and uh, that's why we looked for some other possibility and uh, this is where source to source compilation came into a pic into the pic picture it was clear that uh, this isn't something we can do without source mo source code modification and as we can see we can do it with macros uh, or without serious limitations so if we could change the source code without the limits of macro expansion for example to decorate this new int call with a, a call to some fun function which knows every information we need then we could uh, create a source, a source compiler which uh, allows us to log every single uh, everything as as really happens 
For example, we can even log uh, type devs and other other spec uh, specific uh, constructs which might uh, help us in deducing the root cause of our memory problems. So, of course, we need more uh, macros than this uh, single one here. We need new delete for the operator calls and so on. But it's a good way. And uh, there is their Silang tooling, which is designed for exactly tasks like this. There are a AST measures in it, which we can use uh, to find every new delete or other calls interesting to us. It works for most C++, C++ programs. And uh, uh, it uh, allows us to write our transformation as, at the source code level, as source-to-source -source, uh, transformation. Or it makes it even possible to just uh, modify the program during Clang compilation and use it directly without actually emitting uh, a modified source on the disk. There are, of course, problems with these two. We can't handle everything. The biggest one is conditional macros. For example, here uh, the program compiles different parts uh, based on the compiler used. And uh, Clang tries to be uh, compatible with the other uh, compilers by defining their macros. But if we start our uh, conditional expression checking for Clang, we can be sure that it is Clang. Of course, this is something we can solve, since if there is a struct like this uh, in a program, it most likely means that the code bet between the second and third conditions won't compile with Clang. So this is something we have to accept. And if we are speaking about macros, there are, it is possible to create a macro which expands to a new expression. First, I doubt that this will be very rare. We would use a construct like this, but it happens, uh, it is uh, present in many open source projects, uh, mostly used for factory macros. They are uh, more uh, longer than this simple extra example, and uh, they usually uh, need to stringify, stringify the type or the name or some other parameters. That's why they can't use templates for this task. So when we want to transform this source code, we have to make a decision. We can uh, expand this macro, which uses new, and uh, place the expanded macro in the modified source code so we can log it, or we can choose to ignore this allocation, maybe emit a warning as the source source to source compiler. But uh, this is something uh, which uh, which means a great problem to uh, source code transformation. The problem is that we can't expand all the macros in the program. That would be too much. Much, for example, it would expand uh, the compiler uh, specific name macros and uh, stuff like that. And uh, if we want to detect that which macros use really new or delete here, so which are the macros we really have to expand, then we have to run a multi-phase compilation, since first we have to to find every macro which is used, which uses new or delete, then transform them. After the transformation, we have to report the AST. And based that information, we could transform the program to include our logging. So automatic detection is, is slow. 
but uh, another option is to just let the user sp uh, specify the macros uh, which we have to expand. Since there are usually very few macros like this, it's still not a great burden for users. Mm, and also, there are templates. In my first example, I changed new, so it included a specific int type as a string. When we are in a template, we can do that, since in this expansion, we have no idea what to write there. It can be int, it's double, or any other type. And uh, also, this template is most likely in a header file, which is used by multiple transactional units. So we we can't collect every type uh, that every type parameter you, uh, which this template is called in a single uh, compilation step. There's an easy solution, of course. We could use uh, type ID, which requires uh, runtime type information, and that's disabled in some projects. Uh, but if we move this demangul instruction later, uh, by later I mean after the parsing, parsing of our locks, this will be still a uh, compile time uh, call, so we won't cause any overhead with it. But what if, I, I, what if, uh, if we want to keep uh, runtime information disabled, or if we don't like the fact that we can't see uh, type defs with uh, type ID. We could uh, create a template which uh, contains the name of our type. This is a sing simple uh, struct as a template with one static member. The problem with uh, these templates is that you can't, uh, can't uh, sp uh, specialize a template after it's first used, and the struct uh, used with this function might be defined later than the template itself. itself. So we have to find a we have to find a uh, good position where we can insert uh, spe uh, specializations for our template. And static members are uh, great for uh, this, uh, uh, this problem, since if we don't, we can uh, uh, de uh, declare anywhere these name structs since we won't, won't define a new specialization. This is the same, we, ju we just allocated some space for this static uh, const. And uh, even if we, if we don't add these markers at the end, it's just a linker error, not a compilation error. So, uh, used like this, we can add a generic uh, a template struct at the beginning of our source code in the main file of the compilation and add every uh, specific name to the used in that compilation to, te to the end of the file. And the linker uh, will make the linker will uh, make sure that everything works in the compiled program. This uh, is a simplified version because there are uh, some more specific cases where you can't where you can't write down, down this uh, special uh, this uh, declaration here. For example, if this struct e inside struct s is private. 
you can't create this this uh, name here uh, or also C++ eleven allows to uh, local types to be used in template functions, which also won't be which you also won't be uh, able to use uh, as template par parameters later. But this ca can be uh, solved using uh, Adding addi using additional code, for example, making this struct friend of other structs and things like that. Okay. And uh, I spoke about allocators and vectors and other containers uh, previously. We also have to add that, uh, code to calls in vector. Uh, set, map, and other STL, STL containers or types we want to uh, manage. The idea is here that if we can add a marker uh, marker variable to every function in vector, then this then this macro may, might expand to a variable uh, which will be constructed when we enter the function and destructed when we leave it. So we know that when uh, we see an allocation and we have this variable uh, which might uh, use a global flag or something like that, then we know that this allocation was, do was done by vector and we can uh, show this information in our logs. Of course, there are in, uh, initializer lists. For example, if we have a class he simple class hierarchy, here this allocation in parent will happen before our marker here constructed, constructed since uh, parent is allocated before the child constructor enters. This is really a rare, ca rare case. I didn't see any source code uh, using uh, something like this. But if we really have to manage this, we can add additional inheritance parameters to classes. It can be even private. The important part is that it has to be the first. Since uh, Inheritance, uh, if we inherit from, a struct, uh, from, a, from an empty struct, uh, it won't make our uh, derivative class bigger. So we won't change anything in the result of the source code. It's just a marker that will be executed before the parent constructor is called. So we can log this information in the context of the child. This is currently not in the in our source to source compiler because I didn't see really any use for it, but it could be added as an additional uh, inheritance. And also, I mentioned modifications in the standard library before with the macros. Uh, I said that it's a problem because we do not wish to modify system files. That would make, uh, uh, for example, compiling other uh, programs without uh, our tool uh, so we have to uh, figure, figure, uh, do something about this uh, to L of the modification of system or external library files without actually modifying those uh, system or external library files. One uh, option is uh, that if we use a, a version of where 
we don't actually write out the files, just, just modify them in memory and compile using that. But if we want to do a correct source-to-source -source, uh, compilation and keep the files on the disk, we can use a mapping configuration, which uh, means that we won't uh, save the files in USR include, in USR include, but in some other direction, directory, and modify the compiler com uh, commands to use this directory, directory too. Okay, so if we modify our source code, we still have to log uh, do something with the modifications. The source-to-source -source compiler adds macro calls to the original program. For example, log new, log new array, and so on. And uh, we wanted to keep the transformation step and the uh, actual logging step separate, so we can use uh, this tool with any, with any logger. We might just want to log the allocations, or we want to log call stacks. Uh, we might need a thread safe logger, or something that will be very fast in a single threaded program. So it's separated. We have macros, and we can define these macros to uh, some, something that really logs the information. This logic guppy API, of course, has some limitations. The biggest one is that uh, loggers have to be implemented mostly as libraries, not as just header-only uh, header files. That's because, for example, if we see this uh, log instruction, it just uses the standard output to write something out. But it needs IOStream to do that. And if we modified anything in IOStream and include an IOStream be before our logger, then it will cause compilation errors. So it's uh, actually we can write this until we modify the standard library. But since we want to modify the standard library because of vectors and other containers, this is a bad idea. We want to write something like this, where the header file only calls, or calls some logging function, which is implemented in uh, a C++ file. And that might use IOStream or any other library it wants. It's uh, also important that if we just uh, change every uh, macro name used by the source uh, code transformation to a function call, it might make our program uh, really slow, since uh, it won't be able to inline these, uh, these uh, calls. So we want uh, to keep everything uh, we can in the header file, and just uh, we can't include anything in our logger. And so, allocations might happen, happen very early, before our mine function is called, or before IOStream or other C++ standard uh, classes are initialized. So we, our, the loggers have to be ready uh, for to be called really early in the program initialization phase. I actually uh, realized it, this when my uh, simple logger using the standard output crashed because there was no count in that phase of the program. And because uh, we are initializing it really early, we can't use the command line arguments uh, which are available in main to configure our logger. So we can't, uh, can't write a program which takes a command line argument uh, specifying the log, log file name of our, la our logger. But we can choose to have no con configuration 
for example, uh, our output port file is uh, based on the current time. Or we can configure it compile time, specify the name in a macro or something, or a static variable. Or, of course, configuration files also can be used. Loggers also have to be included. Uh, we decorated our program with uh, 10 or so macros. So if they aren't defined somewhere, it won't compile. If our project uses uh, pre-compiled headers, it's really easy. We can just add, it, add the, the logger include to the pre-compiled header, and it will work. But uh, most projects don't use pre-compiled headers. And I think nobody wants to modify uh, hundreds of C++ files just to include a logger. So uh, we also added this uh, to the uh, source code uh, transformation step. It can prepend uh, includes. So you can specify the logger you want, and it includes in the program source code. There are four loggers uh, currently in type grind. The first is knob. Uh, as its name suggests, it does nothing. It's just there, there that we can test that the modified program also compiles. There is a dem demo count logger, which is uh, uh, great for uh, testing that uh, the transformation works. It just prints out that OK, it an, alloc an allocation happened. And since it's count, it has the problem I'm, I mentioned with early allocations. There is a better CSV logger, which uh, emits a comma-separated file. It's, it is uh, it's, so it is ready. It's pro production ready, but uh, not the fastest. It writes out the information as soon as it uh, it's available, and there's the buffered binary log logger, which aims to be really a logger which you can use in uh, production code. I will speak about it a uh, little more. So. The goal was to create something that can be really used uh, in programs. The, so something which uh, has minimal speed overhead, minimal, per, minimal uh, performance multiplier on your program. Uh, I think the biggest program with uh, tools, like Vol, uh, tools like Walgreens is that they are really slow. They will make your programs uh, three, four, or more time uh, slower than it is originally. So this uh, logger is ju has just a 1.5 multiplier, so a worst case of 50 percent. I think that some that's something uh, reasonably good for. Uh, logging heap allocations. It also generates minimal output. That's why the binary is in its name. It logs out everything in a binary form, which means it requires post-processing so you can read it. And it's also thread safe so you, so you can use it in multi-threaded programs. Uh, to To make it thread safe and fast, the output is separated into two, two files. There's a string table. It's just a pointer and string mapping to make sure that we write all strings out only once because they are long and pointers are uh, really smaller. And the run table, which is just an array, it contains uh, every d data uh, uh, every data related to allocations and uh, deletions in the program. And there are two files for every thread, so we can 
uh, write these buffers without locking. The string table format is simply see, uh, it's simply a text file uh, with a comma separating the pointer address and the string content and contains every string used by the logger. Uh, the key problem here is that uh, we have to check if a string is already in our buffer waiting to be written out, or this is the first time we saw it. Currently, it's using only a hash table, which is still reasonably fast, but a better and more complex uh, version could uh, uh, generate a static initialization table, in which case uh, we would write out every string to this uh, table, maybe even at the transformation phase uh, when we are transforming the source code, not just the ones used. And the uh, other format containing all locations has every other information uh, about the, what happens with the heap. It has a timestamp, uh, source code location, uh, type of the event and everything you saw in the macros. So type names, size, and information about the owner, which is, uh, uh, for example, vector, uh, set, or anything you, you used. So this is a binary file, which requires some post-processing. For example, uh, pair, pairing allocations and uh, delete calls allows us to see memory leaks or double deletes or other uh, memory problems like that. Or calculating the object, object lifetime uh, allows us to generate data about uh, statistics about the lifetime of certain types. And also, since we have uh, two files per thread, we have to linearize that into a single data stream. After post-processing, uh, we can load it into multiple output formats. For example, the sa same CSV used by the simple CSV logger or uh, massive output format, which allows us to use tools uh, based on uh, that format. For example, a visual, the visual is I, I, I uh, shown in, a, in one of the first slides. Or we can load it into an embedded database usable in C++ and uh, many other languages, mostly script languages. And this allows us to write uh, easy database queries about our HEPA locations. So, for example, here is a graph generated by a massive visualizer. It's really simple, it's just a vector containing int. The important part is that here, inst instead of the last entry in the call stack, we have the type, uh, since the massive exporter exports uh, type names instead of call stack entries in the log file. And for a more, uh, more better example, this is uh, a graph of calling CMake. As you can see, uh, there are classes from CMake. And the colors in this uh, graph now really means different types in, during the execution of CMake. So to use uh, this source transformation, we need a configuration file. For example, like this. As I said, uh, we usually have to include a logger into the source code. Uh, so how it will find our macros. We also have to provide a file mapping. 
uh, which will tell uh, the trans the source to source compiler where to put where to put uh, the different uh, files it executes it it finds it allows to use relative directory names uh, meaning the directory uh, where we put the configuration file usually the source directory of the program we want to transform and we usually want to transform usr include or uh, whatever the system include directory ca called in our system and we can add wedged entries uh, where we can specify the the functions we want to query with a reg regular expression we also can add a custom name to it for example std vector and uh, also flags uh, flags are just uh, an integer number which uh, might be used for loggers currently the only one is uh, the flag named one which uh, means it's an ownership uh, it's an ownership entry so allocations within this function will be logged uh, as owned by vector the files uh, the after this we have to process the pro uh, process the uh, source files every source file in the program we want to transform for that uh, we need a compiler uh, a compilation database it can be generated by same using a simple uh, define or there are some tools which are uh, designed to generate uh, this uh, compile commands json file uh, while you execute a make so it's easy to generate for any proje uh, project and after that we have to call uh, the source to source compiler for every file in the compilation database which is uh, for example a few lines in any script language this uh, uh, this script only transforms the files it can currently see some uh, projects for example uh, cmake or clang use generated source files so they compile a tool execute that tool uh, on some source file files and uh, uh, this tool will generate more source files based on it if you uh, just uh, uh, process the source files available before the make command was called you can't change these uh, files since they are not there or they will be overwritten by the custom build step in these projects uh, in this case you have to use a more complex uh, script which wraps the compiler command uh, and runs the source transformation after every executed compiler command but uh, uh, before every executed compiler command but it's a more complex script it wouldn't fit into a single slide so instead I'm instead I'm just uh, showing this one and uh, that's how you that's uh, how it works uh, and hopefully I can show you a live demo about uh, transforming a simple program using this tool for example here it is it just uh, creates, a create, uh, creates a vector with some entries and there's also a bug in it uh, it's easy to see we i forgot the destructor here and most likely you would detect this error by many tools that's not really the point of the demo it just made it a bit more interesting so 
I have this source file and as I said I can create a compilation database by with CMake if I press uh, if I add the CMake export compiler command on flag it uh, code like this mm. I just added an extra error there so code like this CMake generates a compile commands JSON file which is in our case contains just one entry the main file of the program I and uh, I also have the script I'm, I'm shown in one of the slides here which processes this file with the source transformation tool so if I run this you can see that it modified uh, many files mostly in the standard library uh, which were, was were included by uh, my program oh sorry I just forgot a step so it, it, it uh, created the demo instrumented directory here and if we check it there's our mine CPP and there's the a folder named USR include because the project contained a simple mapping which said move USR include there it also added uh, ownership information to vector so uh, as you can see transformed like this it only uh, copied the main CPP and the uh, uh, files in the system headers used by the program it didn't uh, copy any other files for example our CMake list used to build the program or the other files present in this directory if you need uh, the files uh, not the other files in your project you have to copy them manu manually uh, usually, uh, usually by checking out the enti entire project directory another time and now we also have to modify our program so it includes some more directories the modified system files there uh, USR include is actually it actually contains many symlinks the two directories we are really interested in this case are the C++ per 5 and the C++ per uh, x86 Linux GNU we also want to include the directory where our logger resides and we also have to link the logger since it's a static library so we can build this program hopefully it will build it didn't which means it didn't find the linked library somehow that most likely means my link directory's instruction is wrong there hmm.
but it is there I think you have the logger directory in a different place logger oh. subdirectory in a different place in the CMake list I had Mm. Uh, ah, again, yeah. yes, yes, yes. There's a build. Okay. And then you have, the the, you have a second line? build in there. The previous line. Uh, the previous line is good. The uh, include directory isn't in the build directory. It's, it's in the source directory. And also in the next line, in the link directories, you have two build subdirectories. Oh, yes. The, I, I wrote the build in the wrong place. Yes. Okay. Okay, so, okay, the build, no? So, there is my executable, I can run it, and if we check it, there is a type grind directory with a timestamp, which contains two files, since this was a single threaded program, and I can call the converter tool on it, for example, to generate a CSV file, which is, it's not really hu human readable, but it contains every information, at least it, it's not binary. But if we want to see something better, uh, we can export in massive format and use massive visualizer on it. I hope it opens on the external screen. Okay, it did. So there is our data uh, generated by our script, and we can see the, that there is a vector allocation up there with in blue. There's an unsigned car green, which is uh, great because we do have an unsigned car uh, allocation. It's actually this uh, unsigned int 8, since uh, the massive visual visualizer uh, shows the canonical type of the uh, type, and the canonical type of uh, unsigned int 8 is unsigned car. So that's why we see that. But we also see a uh, really increasing unsigned core owned by STD vector, which is something we shouldn't. And of course, it's there because uh, vector will call the copy constructor of the class. And since we told uh, the source uh, code transformation tool that everything allocated by vector is owned by vector. It thinks that the uh, allocation generated by the copy constructor of this, it's allocated by vector, so it's owned by vector. Okay, so this is how we can see uh, a simple memory error uh, using this tool. And after this, it wouldn't be hard to, hard to guess that uh, uh, most of our memory is allocated by the error in the copy constructor or the uh, not existing destructor. Okay, so as you can see, it. Uh, okay, uh, I change back to this. As you can see, uh, this tool is uh, uh, usable. It works for simple programs and it even works for uh, larger programs. Uh, I managed to compile, for example, CMake or Clang with it. But of course, uh, there is a long to-do list associated with it. I want to show a few uh, more interesting entries for, uh, from it. Uh, placement new. I said that we don't have to log it. It, it doesn't allocate anything. So why should we uh, why should we care about where we call placement new? Well, for example, this code is from the Clang source, 
because it heavily uses uh, placement U. Uh, when it passes the EST or basically does anything uh, which uh, might use uh, great number of types, it allocates a buffer where it will first store a generic EST entry and later it calls placement new with a more specific entry like type ID, new expression or something. So when uh, I instrumented Clang with uh, type grind, I saw that we allocated a lot of uh, very few entries. I didn't say that it, uh, which AST nodes were really used by the program. So uh, this is something uh, uh, which is definitely a good uh, improvement. The problem is that it's not, not easy to do anything with a placement new, since we can only be sure about its uh, construction, and we have no information uh, about what happens with this type after that. We know that at a certain, certain pro, uh, point in the program, a uh, place in the memory uh, will be used by, for example, a type ID expression. But we don't know when uh, will be this distracted. We might assume that when the memory area where we place this, uh, place the, this type with placement new, is uh, destroyed, it's the end of its lifetime. But you just saw, saw the example with vector, which reallocates the buffer every time it's full. So even if we release the memory used by this type, you, we can be sure that the type was really destroyed there. So this probably requires some uh, program-specific uh, heuristics uh, to be useful. There's also the, a problem with current ownership, our current ownership logging. Consider this simple program. Here we have a vector of strings where uh, vector and string both uh, allocates memory. So we want the memory owned by string to be owned by string and the memory owned by vector owned by vector. Which means we can't tell how much memory is used by a certain vector containing strings, since that only locks the memory used by the vector, not by the strings. Uh, so we have to make this uh, more generic by, by making this ownership uh, work uh, on longer chains. Also, I already showed you a simple example what with the pre uh, problems with the preprocessor. There are more, uh, more complex. For example, if we have a header file with a conditionally defined uh, macro, to decide something's type. And uh, we have a CPP file, which includes this header multiple times with differently defined macros. This might result in the same, uh, same new expression, for example, in this header, uh, expanding to different results. And that means even if we expand that macro, we still modify the same source location twice, uh, which we can do. So to allow something like this, uh, we actually have to duplicate this header file for the two different uh, uh, macro set. 
since without that we can't write two versions of our code into an instruction there. And also, the most interesting one, I think, is uh, understanding the type hierarchy. For example, if you have a parent class with just two derivative classes, uh, currently they will result in allocation re re records of the three classes, and uh, we will have no idea that they are related. Okay, if we wrote the code, we know that they related, but we can't, uh, can't uh, write a query that we want to see the memory used by parent and its derivatives. So if we extract this information, it will be also possible. And uh, this actually leads to uh, other interesting problems, uh, other interesting possibilities, since uh, if we are modifying the source code anyway, it might be possible to implement a type-safe uh, memory sanitizer, where we can check if, we, when we access the memory, not just that it's, it's there, but also that is the correct type. And to do that, we need information about the type hierarchy in our program. There are also uh, improvement possibilities in tools and loggers. As you can see, I showed you graphs with a tool, used, uh, tool developed for Massive. So it wasn't written by us. Uh, we have no graph generation uh, tool based on our data yet. But we could generate uh, more and more, spe more specific different graphs than Massive. Also, it would be interesting if we could uh, do real-time logging. It's not that uh, it's not impossible to implement with the uh, with the logging uh, com separated logging components, uh, which also uh, with a nice UI. Uh, which would be, again, something uh, making this tool more usable. For example, like the dot memory tool seen earlier. And also, measurements, uh, the transformation or, uh, already done by the source code transformation, I love to uh, implement more interesting measurements. For example, that uh, function marker macro could be used to measure function execution time uh, for certain fu functions in the source code. Or we could uh, uh, mark functions no leak. So the uh, logger could uh, emit a warning when a, a function mark, mark no leak actually leaks memory, so it, it didn't free anything it all, uh, everything it allocated. This can be implemented even with a logger, which checks this runtime, uh, making it possible to, it, it, uh, to trigger a breakpoint. So you, when your no leak function leaks and you run your program with a deb debugger, it, uh, it uh, triggers a breakpoint and you immediately can see uh, which memory you leaked. Okay. And uh, this was my talk about type grind. Uh, I thank you for your attention, and I hope you have questions. Yes? Uh, can you compare this with uh, GPAP tools in terms of performance and uh, limitations? Uh, which software again? Uh, GPAP tools? Uh, no, uh, I only. Uh, so the question was if we compared it with uh, GPAP. GPR to, tools. Uh, no, I only compare this with uh, Wallgrind so far. So uh, I and the original uh, performance of the program. Uh, 
So I know that it might result in a 50% slower execution than the original, original unmodified program. Okay? Yes? Uh, maybe a trivial question, but I have to ask this. Are you sure, are you, can you prove in, for example, by a rich set of regression tests that just by an accident you won't modify uh, the execution of program, the, con the control flow, that by, uh, in, by changing the source code you won't uh, change the, uh, what happens actually in the program? Yes, that's an interesting question. Uh, and one of the reasons behind the existence of the NOP logger, which uh, which doesn't do any, yeah, okay. Uh, so the question was if, if I can prove that my transformations won't modify the program. And that's the reason behind the existence of the NOP logger, which only transforms the program back into its original state. So if I run my program with the NOP logger, it shouldn't print any, or out anything, but it should still work. Of course, uh, I don't have perfect proof that uh, it won't happen uh, since the sep because of separation, even if the source code transformation doesn't modify the program, a logger might. So a logger might do something that modifies the execution of the programs. I can't do anything with it. I hope uh, and I think that the transformation won't change the execution of the programs and the example loggers also won't. They only log information out. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you.